today we have a pleasure to have Ninat Dangyan from uh, Fudan University in Shanghai. So actually Ninat is moving very soon to our group in Warsaw and I'm very happy for, for that. But he's still formally with, uh, in, in Shanghai. And today he will be, talk, will be presenting his work on the verification of stabilizer states. So the floor is yours. Uh, All right, thank you, Michal. So I will share my screen. Uh, hi, everyone. So at this exceptional hour, as uh, Michal said, I will talk today about uh, my recent work with uh, people in my group at Shanghai on optimal verification of stabilizer states. The archive number is here. Uh, right. And this is the work with uh, my uh, postdoc colleague, Yun Guang Han, and the group leader, Huang Jun Chu. All right. <clears throat> so, like in the broad stroke, the main task that we will be thinking about today is how to identify slash certify a quantum state. And so the general setup uh, is that I have some quantum state, some unknown quantum state that I want to characterize or learn about them. And this, I have many, many copies of them. So it's IID state and it could be mixed. So this is just a cartoon that I would say the, the dots are the qubits and then this uh, connection or some kind of entanglement. Don't, don't think about graph state yet, but I, I, will, I will talk about graph state later. And in general, uh, when people think about, well, I didn't define completely unknown quantum state, they think about a uh, full quantum state tomography. And the idea is that using any measurement as your disposal, for example, entangle measurement, uh, you try to um, identify, just single out the state sigma here from uh, all the possible state in the space, state space. <clears throat> but this is well known that this requires an exponential amount of resource uh, for the number of samples. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you require measurements to be entangled. Uh, in serial or parallel, and what I mean here in serial is that you <clears throat> do an entangled measurement on each copy of the state of the unknown state or by parallel I mean that in some even in some scheme you must have the ability to do entangled measurement across multiple copies at the same time. And I would say these are uh, I guess for the current state of device that we have is not it doesn't really it scales pretty badly. Um, so, but like, uh, oh. Ninat, can I can I ask? Uh, yes, please. Like, what is because uh, when I have d-dimensional quantum quantum system, I have uh, and I have quantum state on it. So I have roughly speaking d squared parameters, real parameters that describe it, right? Right. So, so just na uh, just naively, I would need. Uh, like the sum, the sample complexity should be like, uh, okay, it should scale like at least like this squared, maybe like d to the fourth power. What uh, what are those uh, like sample? What what are the those optimal scale like uh, optimal scalings? Right, exactly. Uh, I think it's exactly as you said. It should should be about d square. Mm -hmm. And it has a uh, dependence on like, yeah, those log, inver log of inverse delta and one over epsilon square. Epsilon is, mm -hmm. should be the fidelity in this mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. which actually we will see something comparable in the verification okay. here. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, yes, yeah, so I draw this measurement device really big because it's supposed to be a giant entangled measurement. But what we want is this little small one. So suppose that now we only have, say, a single qubit measurement. Um, luckily, 
uh, usually for quantum tomography is not really required because you usually have a pretty good idea of uh, what 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 your device is doing. Maybe it's nicely, but you have some idea of what states the device is producing. So I would say in a lot of cases, you would be happy with just verifying a quantum state. By that I mean, uh, yes, yeah, as is written here, the quantum state verification goal is to verify that your unknown quantum state is close to some target pure state of your choosing. Well, yeah, I think it would be very hard to work with target mixed state, but in practice, you probably, in a lot of time, you, you, you want to have pure state anyway. And even, the, in, even <clears throat> more than that, uh, we want to, let's see, assume as little as possible on the ability of what we can do. So we would just use local projective measurements. And here as a side sort of remark cartoon here. So before in full quantum state tomography, you want to just single out some state sigma from the whole state space. But here you have a target state row over here and you just want to sort of like decide whether your state is epsilon close to rho or outside of it. A second comment. So <clears throat> in the literature, by local measurement, usually they mean uh, something that can be measured by product observable. Something here, like if I have two subsystem label A and B, uh, I would say that the observable, this tensor product is constitute a local measurement, even though technically, you know, that this is not really a local measurement, it's a, like a correlated measurement. The, the true local measurement would be something on the left-hand side here, but with the classical post-processing, you can, you can get the result of, of this product observable as well. For example, can I, I ask, for, can I ask okay. something? Yeah. So, uh, of course, like on the level of, uh, I mean, of course, like uh, in some sense, of course, like if you have, uh, if you're talking about just uh, P of EMs that recover the statistics, right? It doesn't matter, you can mm -hmm. do local measurement and then do post-processing and get this, this tensor product of operators. But right. uh, my question is, uh, in those schemes that are uh, not parallel, but you have adapt adaptive schemes, ah. right? So uh, then if you have like instrument or if you care like what happens to your state after the measurement, so, so then mm -hmm. it can matter. So do those schemes explore uh, like, are there like, iterative uh, or is it like you when you have a, a given copy you don't reuse it later right so yeah the short answer is that all that i'm aware of in these like recent subfield of verification of quantum states people don't care about the post measurement states thank you uh Yes. <clears throat> so I will tell you about the specific protocol very soon, but to just sort of give an idea of how it would look like, uh, I will give an example of distinguishing between four bill states. So, so here is not, is neither tomography or verification. It's just some ex toy exercise. So if you have, yeah, say if you want to verify whether your state, given these choices of four state, whether verify whether is the, is the zero, zero plus one, one state, then what you would do with local measurement. So of course, uh, with not local measurement, you would just project onto this state itself, but that is not allowed here. You would say measure the relative phase xx and you get, you know, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and you, then you measure the parity, and then you, by this result, you know exactly uh, which state you have. 
Um, right. So what is the lesson here that I will be important later is that, well, here I just choose measurement that uh, has the target state as a plus one eigenstate. So it just fix the target state. And then when I get plus one, uh, then I have some idea. Well, in this case, I know exa exactly like which subset of state I, I have, I could have, uh, and so on. And also that one, a single measurement here is, is not enough because you cannot distinguish between different states, orthogonal states, uh, states that are orthogonal to your target state. Right. And, okay, yeah. I have one more question. I really wish others could ask questions, but, uh, so, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's like a follow up to the, to the previous one. Uh, so here you are measuring like stabilize, like stab you are doing stabilizer measurements, like X, X, Z, Z, Z. And then the, the, the thing is, here is another catch. Because typically when you do, uh, when you do uh, those uh, XX measurements or ZZ measurement, the mm -hmm. most natural way to do it would be to use local, uh, local measurement, okay? Like mm -hmm. local Pauli Z measurement on first qubit, local Pauli Z measurement on the second qubit, and then post-process, right? Yes. Uh, but there is a catch. Although this ZZ can be measured jointly with XX, because they, they, they commute. You cannot measure them jointly when you use uh, separable measurements, right? Exactly. So in this verification framework, they are count as two different set Yes. Okay, yeah. which is, okay, it's fine. Uh, so then it's like you are going to count it as a like extra, it's not going to be implemented in a single round, so to say like. You're going right, so things that are, okay. Okay. Simultaneously measurable, we necessarily have the same so Pauli at the uh, yeah at the same Q at each Q. Okay, well, good. So it makes sense. It makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. Thanks for the question. So yeah, continuing from that. So here we just distinguishing between four states, and the outcome are deterministic. But in general, you have linear combinations of these states, or even mixed states, and then things will get probabilistic. You will get some ch chance of error. So here is the common hypothesis testing scenario that are, that are adopted by these uh, quantum verification people, because now I'm one of them, is that you have a, a bunch of, let's see how to say this, it's like you have several several measurements. You have a projector onto that projector that in, uh, has the the target state as uh, the plus one eigen set pi, and then you have the complement of that. So it's every every measurement is a two outcome measurement, and then each of these measurement index j is associated with some probabilities. You so you just like roll a dice and uh, choose to make measurement in your set. And then if you obtain, uh, so to say, the correct answer that your state, uh, the state is, uh, produce the same result as your target state, then you keep doing it again and again. And you stop whenever you obtain the negative result. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I actually didn't get it. Ah, uh, yes, so, so, so in this scenario, you have local projective measurement at your dis disposal, so you have many of them, like XX and ZZ in the last page. And so for XX, uh, you have two project, yeah, basically these are two outcome, uh, two, two possible measurement results, plus one or minus one. And with the, uh, and this measurement at this size, so that if you have your target state, you, you would get plus one every time. Just disregarding noise, right? Uh, 
And this protocol is that if you measure and you get the yes, correct result, then you just keep uh, yeah, rolling the dice and keep measuring your, your projective measurements. And so each route can be like, uh, is re you randomly choose the measurement in your disposal. And whenever you obtain the negative result, then you say, well, this state must, must be far away from your target state, which sounds really simplistic because it, uh, yeah, just, just na naively it could be the case that there is the property of accepting the state is so low that it's useless. Uh, um, but can I can I ask? So you use like for every measurement query, you use. I mean, in principle, you could use copy of the state, right? Right, right. right. So yeah, yeah, I just clarify that for each route, you you yeah you you use up one copy. Because uh, like if you did it, then you would have uh, you will be in this instrument business, and then you would have uh, uh, like the same result over and over after. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for yeah clarification. Uh, right. So, uh huh. Hi. Uh, Hi. So just just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, look, you're performing, let's say, the same measurement. Okay, no wait, I'm not. Good. Oh, you're not performing the same measurement uh, over and over and over again, right? You're performing different. Okay, so the values of J, J means different measurements. So okay, it's another element of the same stabilizer group. Is it? So, exactly. So you randomly pick a measurement. No, I'm just thinking that like, you know, if you like, instead of, uh, look, the in, there is a certain amount of information that you are throwing away about the state if then you reject. Do you agree with that? There are scenarios where you are when you reach, suppose you reject, if, even if you get minus one once, you are ending mm -hmm. up throwing a, the thing away. You're throwing information about the state away. Is that like, can you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Yeah, so, I think know, it could certainly be more sophisticated. Because the way I see it, you see, you're encoding, like, you know, suppose you don't, you don't get all plus ones. Okay. Suppose you have some plus ones and some, like, you know, most plus ones and some minus ones, you know, that still have information about the original state. In fact, to go a bit more further, if you know a bit more about the noise, etc., you can say that ultimately what you're doing is encoding uh, encoding it all in a classical error correcting code and which you can again correct for uh, mm -hmm. you know, to a very good extent. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I would and say... For instance, oh. like suppose you do this measurement three times and suppose you know, you say that I, I accept it only when I get one, one, zero. Okay. Instead, you could mm -hmm. adopt a majority rule case. Like I accept, I accept it when it is, uh, sorry, uh, you, you earlier, uh, you accept only when it's one, one, one. Instead of doing that, you can just say that, oh, I accept it when it is uh, one, 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 or, you know, one, one minus one as well. Okay. Sorry. I, I should have. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it ultimately you get. You know, maybe it's a sim simple exercise just to see that, like, you know, all these things become stored in a classical in error correcting code, and you can probably correct for that as well instead of rejecting everything. But never mind that. Yeah, carry on. Right. So, I mean, so I guess I have two comments. One is that, yeah, I agree with you that I think this whole framework, this all this has all this assumption so that they can have analytic results. So, I think Huangjun also mentioned this at some point of time, right? When he, he was giving a talk or uh, Probably some when he was introducing uh, verification, I think he mentioned the fact that one way, one thing of going forward uh, on this project is to say that like you know when you reject some cases you could uh, uh, you know accept as well. So probably yeah. Any case, no, it's been many months. Never mind that. Right, and actually, yeah. That my second remark is that it's also something that Huang Yu mentioned is that you could try to adapt this to instead of verifying quantum state, verifying quantum code. And there you, yeah, there's a lot of things. Like you don't want to disturb the code space, for example. So it's, it's, a, it's a, probably a valuable generalization. Okay. Can, can, I add, uh, can I ask something more here? So 
but also when you have a positive answer, like if you don't reject, okay, you can in principle, okay, it's a bit, how should I phrase it? Like you can measure some, uh, you know, you have some locality, like, okay, so, so it's, it's a matter of like, what, uh, how should I say, instead of just measuring a given stabilizer, you can mm -hmm. jointly measure quite a few of them. Like, you know, imagine that you, okay, even if you use local measurement, right? If you measure all Z, Z like, uh, you know, uh, if you can do only like local Pauli measurements, right? So mm -hmm. assume you did, let's say on the first qubit Z, on the second Z and so on. So then you sort of simultaneously measure all, uh, like all stabilizers corresponding to uh, like monomials from, from, from Z, right? But now, you can also, uh, what you can also do, you can uh, uh, use like, then imagine that sometimes you measure locally X, sometimes you measure locally Y, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? And then you can simultaneously measure this on one state, right? And then just verify, so you know what you're looking for, you know what your target state was, right? And right. then kind of simultaneously, simultaneously check for uh, many for many possible stabilizers of the state that you are interested in, right? So, is this the second example so, kind of similar to the first, like ZCC? So you yes, basically it's similar. Yeah, it's just like the, uh, yes, yes, but it's yes, like yes. it might be like then, then I understand. Yeah, yeah. Then I, I would say that you. Uh, Yes, you already expect the the the, re the later part of my talk. Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So here, so back to this hypothesis testing scenario. So, right, since it's only so you have yes or no answer, and and you are trying to just decide between two hypotheses, this is like classical hypothesis testing. So in principle, you could say that there is a chance that if you have the correct state, you will still be able to get the negative answer. But for simplicity of analysis, uh, in basically what people do is that they say, ignore the noise that, yeah, there is no so-called Taiwan error. And this corresponds to the fact that, uh, or correspond to the requirement that uh, the operator that you measure must have, yeah, the, the target state as a plus one eigenstate. And then on the other side, but on, on the other hand, you still have <clears throat> the so-called type two error is that you can mistake the wrong state for your target state. And this is uh, characterized by the, a parameter delta which uh, actually by, oh, I put the Chernoff style lemma here, but here, here is the Chernoff style lemma. So it says that up to some constant and also uh, epsilon the distance between uh, distance away from your target state, then this failure probability falls off exponentially with the number of big capital N of the samples that you have. And the important thing here is the uh, parameter nu here. So what is it? So to describe these tests mathematically, you would say that, uh, yeah, this collection of yes uh, projector, Borek projector correspond to the, the yes answer. You uh, we call this test projector. And then if you form uh, this convex combination, you get some operator that's also fixed the target state and this uh, is important. So they are given the name verification operator. It turns out that this parameter, this scaling parameter in the exponential is precisely the spectral gap of this operator. So, right, so the for, so is the yeah, gap between the second largest eigenvalue to the largest one, which is always one. All right. And so under this framework, 
uh, there are uh, by now quite a handful of results on so-called efficient or optimal verification of some quantum states. So for example, I think the, yeah, the Polyster Linden Montanaro paper that came out on, <clears throat> on archive on 2017 kind of kickstart this whole thing again. In the past, Haya, Masahito Hayashi did something about like maximally entangled state a long time ago. But basically, so these, this paper proved under this framework an optimal verification of bipartite pure state using those kind of local measurements. Uh, I don't put here efficient here because uh, yeah, usually efficient I would mean is efficient with respect to the number of qubits. So it's some kind of scaling, but of course this is sort of meaningless for bipartite pure state because it's just, you just have two of them. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there are other results on GHC states, hypergraph states. Uh, so these already include graph states. So it's a very big family, but I put the star here because it's, I admit that I have not uh, read every nook and cranny of uh, this hypergraph paper, even though it's from my boss, Wong Jun Ju. But I'm pretty sure it depends a lot on the structure of the graph or hypergraph. So you have some protocol and you have some uh, bound on the sample complexity, but it will depend on the property of graph, uh, specific graph that you are trying to verify. And then there are other states. But so far, the optimal verification is only known for, I think, three cases, this GHG state and anti-symmetric basis states. Hi, uh, Milan. Sure. So optimal means like you're varying over your probabilities PI and you want to select that probability which which has lower spectral gap or higher spectral gap. Ah, so, yeah, so I mean have maximum spectral gap, but it cannot be one for non-product state. Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah, in this talk, I will of course, from the title, talk about optimal verification of stabilizer states. And um, I guess a bit of spoiler, we don't, we are not, we don't really get that like a satisfactory answer like this uniformly for all stabilizer state as once, but uh, we'll see what, uh, what we know about them for now. Ah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the introduction. The so main result for this talk is that I will tell you that there is an efficiency bound. So the spectral gap or the bound on the sampling complexity for a verification of stabilizer states that is a constant, does not depend on a number of qubits or specific state. But this is, I just say, this is just a bound. It's, uh, we don't know how to prove that it's saturable analytically yet? Um, sorry? Uh, like, sure. Is it Please. lower or upper bound for the sample complexity? Uh, right, lo yes, lower bound, so it's, it's an upper bound for the spectral gap, right? Okay, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and so what we will do, uh, which I don't think I'll go into many details, that uh, we show that the bow can be saturated at least for up to some number of qubits where we can still do, uh, or where we bother to do uh, run the algorithm by just algorithmically and explicitly construct optimal measurement scheme. So basically it will turn into some eigenvalue minimization problem, which is a linear program. All right, so, oh, okay, just look at the time. So stabilizer and graph state. Uh, yes, I think for everyone in this room at least have heard, have like a passing knowledge about stabilizer states and how they are quite everywhere in applications of quantum information, like in error correction, circuit sharing, or measurement-based quantum computation. 
Uh, so I think I'll spare you the, the like, colloquial introduction. <laughs> and yes, go straight to the point that this stabilizer state and having also verification in mind that th these are exactly states, quantum states that are <clears throat> fixed by a set of operators that form a commuting subgroup of uh, this n qubit poly group without minus the identity technically because you cannot fix anything with minus the identity. And these are called the stabilizer group associated to that state. All right, and these states are popular in a large part because they can be described efficiently. So it's like describing states Instead of using Schrodinger picture, you go to the Heisenberg picture. But for this very special class of state, the Heisenberg picture has a very efficient uh, description. Because you can describe the state by their stabilizer group, which has size 2 to the n, but their yeah, commuting group, aka abelian group. And for qubit, uh, each element also square to I the identity. So I guess it's, it's sort of clear that you only have n independent generators. Right. And this, there is a special class of stabilizer states called prop states, which I just lazily copy from my drawing in the first slide. It's defined by a graph G uh, with the sets of vertices and edges. <coughs> and, um, yeah, there are many ways to describe them. Uh, operationally, it can be created by preparing each qubit in the plus state, so eigenstate of x, and then use a z, z control phase between them. And since it's symmetric, uh, it doesn't matter which one is control, which one is a target, uh, you can draw it as an undirected graph. Another way to describe it, which is, I guess, better for us, is by stabilizer generators. Uh, so, for example, if I look at this left qubit, uh, the stabilizer state generator associated to this qubit is that you put, you measure, you have x at the qubit and then z at every qubit that this qubit is connected to. So it has a simple description of the stabilizer group, graphical description. And the fact that we use it that uh, every stabilizer state is local unitary equivalent to some graph state. So in principle, uh, yeah, local verification of graph state, it, it is sufficient to just think about graph. Uh, it is sufficient to think about uh, graph state if you want to just do a local verification of stabilizer states in general. Um, sorry, Nyat, I, uh, sure. can you go back? So uh, I just, I'm not sure if I understand. So, so basically, this uh, in this formula for S J, you have a big tensor product over Z that are neighbors of the site uh, of the site J. Exactly. So it has okay. J okay. And then, so it's like, like, and then all this is tensored with uh, X J. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And then you have like as many stabilizers as. Uh, yeah, as a number of qubits. Fine, thanks. Yep. So now thinking of verification, uh, since the stabilizer group is commutative, so in general, in, in principle, you really have a bunch of operators or projector that uh, is a, say a candidate for the test projector, meaning that it has the target stabilizer state as a plus one eigenstate. Um, but not all of them will be, able, will be measurable locally. So how, how to characterize uh, these uh, projectors? So, well, it will turn out to be precisely the stabilizer code projector that also project onto the, this particular state. But how you think about it or how I think about it in this paper is that given a Pauli measurement, and this is pretty much what Michal has alluded to in the beginning. Given the Pauli measurement, you can think of them as uh, 
measuring basically a stabilizer group for the products for a product state. That is, if you have like a uh, yeah P one P two P three tensor, then you can take each individual single qubit poly as a generator <coughs> for your so-called like local uh, stabilizer group associated to a product state, and then you can um, generate uh, the whole group form from the product of this local uh, poly, and you get uh, what I depict here as a group uh, you know, stabilizer as a P of this poly. And then you take the intersection of that with the stabilizer group of your target state, and you will get a subgroup, which also you can show is a stabilizer state, uh, is, sorry, is a stabilizer group, but with a reduced size. And you can always get the, it will turn out that uh, yeah, the smallest rank projector associated to this particular poly measurement will be given by basically the code projector that is defined by this subgroup. So this is like a familiar formula where you just sum all the elements of a stabilizer group and you, you get a projector. So Nina, it was pretty dense. Do you, <laughs> do you mind uh, just explaining this again? Ah, uh, so yeah, so the goal is that, so you have all these operator in the, in the stable, in your stabilizer group S, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you try to find out which one of them can be measured locally. Yes. Yeah. And if you just, if you restrict yourself to poly measurement, so this is sort of the characterization of all possible projector that you can measure locally. Uh, is that I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure if I understand. So I, I, I understand that okay, every every element of the Pauli group is a product of single Pauli operators, right? So per se, yes. every uh, every stabilizer can be measured locally, right? Any uh, yes. stabilizer, right? I guess the question like I'm not sure I mean maybe it's like related to this question that I asked. So you want to maybe measure simultaneously as many uh, products, as many uh, stabilizers as possible, maybe. Is that the case or? Right, exactly. Yeah, so, so I guess a few remarks if I can say something. So yeah, these, so first of all, the poly, the measure, poly measurement that you do may not be itself in the stabilizer group, but if it's local, uh, single qubit poly generates something that's in your stabilizer group that uh, that will also help with uh, verification. I guess another important remark is that this is this kind of give uh, correspondence between poly measurement and stabilizer code that project onto your state, but it's not one to one because uh, yeah many uh, there can be different poly measurement that give the same projector. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so, yeah, there's some sort of subtlety going on here. But, but the, uh, the, okay, just see, I want so, to, please, please. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, look, I'm a bit confused over here, looks. Um, you have a one dimensional, sorry, uh, yeah, you have a one dimensional error correcting code. Okay, so you need, uh -huh. you need, uh, sorry, you, yeah, sorry, you have a zero dimensional error correcting code, so you need n generators for that, fine. Now, suppose I perform a measurement which does not belong to the stabilizer group, okay? Then I end up destroying that particular state, okay? I end up, uh, I'm going, I end up destroying that state completely, right? Uh, so, uh, do you use multiple yeah. copies of the same state? Do you use, I mean, like, are you doing this over multiple copies of the same state, or are you I mean, how you cannot keep the state intact if you if you're performing a measurement on some poly which does not belong to the stabilizer group, and if the stabilizer group yeah. is zero damage, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's sometimes it's, it will just try the state and you just use it now. Yeah. Uh, no, like sometimes uh, I 
I mean, no, I, st I guess I still don't understand because um, are you trying to go from like, so an, a K dimensional state progressively towards a zero dimensional space, uh, subspace, uh, coding space. Do you start out with like performing measurements in such a way so that you sequentially go from K di from firstly from N to N minus one to N minus two dot dot up to a one, sorry, a one dimensional state of a zero dimensional state? Well, we would, we would want to Actually, because we try to minimize eigenvalue, we would want to um, measure projector with the as as smallest rank as possible. Does that kind of like add something to your? It does, but um, okay. I think I yeah. I think I'm trained to think in a different way, and you're probably trying to attack it from a different way. So. I think I'll try to see if I can catch up uh, during the rest of the talk. Yeah, yeah I'm also. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I. Okay, I don't know if I should then. Uh, because I just wanted to go back to Michal's question. So, like, but just to phrase it, uh, maybe in my way. So, could you tell me what is non local about S and SP? Uh, because you call this uh, this LP ah. local subgroup, and that's like wh what's uh, what's causing the confusion in my head, at least. Like, what what is non-local okay, in the other yes. guys? So yeah, so yes, so everything in uh, SP can be measured locally, like mm -hmm. by definition. Um, and here in LP, if you sum over all, so this is like the smallest the smallest projector that you can form from this subgroup, uh, you will get something that is still locally measurable mm -hmm. because it is in SP. But if you sum over all the elements, so you get the smallest projector of your stabilizer subgroup, that projector is the target state, which is entangled and you cannot measure it locally. Okay, okay. Yeah. So. So, uh, me I don't fully, okay, so I guess yeah. like I'm, I'm sort of, I, I, okay, I, I sense something interesting here because I'm not sure, okay, uh, I mean, there are some technicalities going on uh, <laughs> here that I guess, uh, okay, they are important, but I guess uh, probably, okay, they are not super clear to us, but it's not an accusation. Uh, like, uh, like what I just, uh, Okay, maybe it's, it's a, I mean, it would be nice if it's understandable, but I just want, wanted to understand philosophy behind it. Because I got actually excited because this, uh, like when you, when you said that, like this previous question of mine kind of maybe uh, had to do something with the, what you're going to discuss. And now, <laughs> but when I look at this, I don't see the connection, okay? And then I'm like very kind of uh, anxious. So let me still ask again. So I understand this yes. original framework. Uh, it was pretty uh -huh. sort of straightforward. I have a bunch of copies of my states and mm -hmm. I measure local like kind of projectors on those stabilizers like locally, right? Uh, and then I sort of test if I, if it's, uh, if I accept or like, or I fail, then I, you know, depending how many, how often I failed, I, I then uh, build my confidence, right? In, in reject. Uh -huh. or accent, right this i got and then my comment was okay uh, if i have probably uh, like stabilizer measurements some like uh, the, i mean if i have stabilizers some of them can be measured jointly actually and this is by yes. the way like a problem that people for example in vqe have right when they want to measure when in quantum chemistry they want to simultaneously uh -huh their state in different bases, right? So they don't want to run the same circuit uh, each time, okay? And so I was thinking that, I mean, in general, one can try to do, I'm sort of in this mindset of this, uh, simply of the simple strategy that you gave in the beginning. So you can imagine that you, uh, that you are playing this game, but instead of doing those projectors, Okay, those, those particular projectors, you are doing kind of simultaneous measurements 
of uh, uh, of stabilizers, okay, that uh, you kind of you have your stabilizer group, full stabilizer mm -hmm. group, and then you can dissect it into bunches in, uh, that you can measure simultaneously with local guys, right? Yes. So that would be the philosophy for me. And then I have yes, like so. a, a confusion. So is this what is uh, being, ha what is happening here on this slide or it's something different? No, it's something different. Uh, yeah. Okay, I was ex I think it's yes, but then it's probably not, sounds like it's not clear, is this the same? So thing? my, like, like my, so where is the like sort of partitioning? I, I imagine that I can partition. It's, I mean, I'm sort of excited because it's either you're doing something which is close to something that, uh, that I think is relevant for other things, ah. or uh, it's either this uh, or it's, uh, you're not doing this and maybe it's exciting to, 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 to pursue what I'm suggesting. And then I, I'm excited, but I don't know what is the reason anyway. So actually would, would this example uh, be good. So, yeah, so for mm -hmm. the GSC okay. state, yeah, you have uh, these generators that are, uh, yeah, stabilizer generator of all X, and then you have this parity Z, Z, Z. Yeah. And all of these Z can be measured together. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, if you measure in Z, Z, and in this framework, this is, this gives you the test protector that is of this form. So it's like a mixed state projector into zero zero one one one. So this effectively measure half of your stabilizer group. Okay. So uh, so basically what you're saying is you can like perform just two measurements. Is it like what is uh, uh yeah mi minimally it it will turn out not to be optimal but it will give some I mean do I mean two measurements by measurements I mean Two measurements on n qubits, okay? Two measurements on n qubits, one measurement, two separable measurements on n qubits. One would yes. be just doing computational basis measurement, and yes, another yes. would be uh, just apply Hadamard or something to move to the x basis. Yes, but yes. this has simultaneously, right? You have to perform these two guys simultaneously, right? Or are you like, do you perform, like, suppose you have like the first generator is ZZ. Okay, no, the first generator is XXX. XX. Up the one after that, below that is ZZ. So I perform both the Z simultaneously, right? If not, then I'm in destroying the state. Well, but you do local measurements, so you sort so of. If I can say something, so I, I think there is uh, a bit of a confusion here uh, coming from the fact that, uh, that Dalima is kind of accustomed to this error correction business, right? Uh, and in error correction, you do apply instruments okay you do apply instruments sort of to like uh, like you, I, I think here it's all about uh, sort of implementing a POVM as far as I understand so like there is nothing like post measurement state here and then you can simultane in that sense you can tell my simultaneously measure uh, ZZ identity identity ZZ identity identity ZZ Etc. You can all of them. You can measure in one go. Uh, Philip does it on the daily basis, for That's example. Correct. <laughs> and uh, many, like what, what you do, you just uh, implement local computational basis measurement, and then you uh, like all of them. They are jointly measurable as POVMs, but not as instruments. Importantly, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then yeah. each like uh, even if you're destroying the state, I mean suppose okay, you're not interested in the post measurement state, but for my clarification, uh, you're performing on single qubit measurements all the time, and each time you end up destroying the state. Yeah. Well, okay. So when you do uh, right, but you can do like the way if you measure first qubit, even if you destroy the state on the first qubit, you can then measure the second qubit, and its state will will be intact. Right? Like, one. Yeah. So it's like you can imagine that you 
to begin with, measure all the qubits in the Z-basis. Yeah. Right? And that's... I still have a bit of a problem with that, but okay, let's carry on. I, mean, I, don't know I guess I we know. got into like a bit of a group nice. meeting. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so once we again. Had, actually, we have more discussions than during the, uh, the appropriate group meeting, which is, <laughs> you know. But next week, yeah. we need to behave. We have a guest next week and the week after, so we cannot <laughs> afford this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so here's my lesson here is that this is, should be kind of flipped because the example here sort of tell you the philosophy and then this terrible formula is how the, the work is really done. That's like characterizing these projectors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there, there will just be just like some, some jargons that appear later and then I will remind you again. Mm -hmm. All right, ah, so I should go quickly a bit. So, <laughs> yeah, this is slide is not so complete, but so it is actually already known from uh, like efficient verification of stabilizer states is actually already known uh, from the Palisa paper. And uh, yeah, so like right, it says efficient, not not doesn't have to be optimal. Is that you can measure all non-trivial stabilizers with equal probability. This is easy to analyze. Although I have some maybe have some comment if I have time. And then the result is that the spectral gap. So this is the inverse. This the inverse of this tell you the sampling complexity has this kind of behavior, which for two qubit is two thirds, so it's just some value and it, it, it decreasing to about one, one half. And uh, another thing in that paper is that you can also choose to just measure N stabilizer generators, uh, but then this would be something like goes like one over N. So the number, the sampling complexity would be linear in N, in the number of qubits. So, so this is better so from that paper. But of course, what they do is just measuring stabilizer, e stabilizers, and not measuring simultaneous like many stabilizers together. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of an abrupt cut, but actually, from uh, this result, so sorry, let me go back and point out some reference. So actually, for for this uh, spectral gap result, which was also generalized. Uh, in the paper by Kunwan and Masahito Hayashi. Uh, and I should, I think it's already published, they should have changed the reference. Uh, that this also holds for separable measurements. And we can actually uh, use this fact to show- so What do you mean? What do you mean it holds for uh, separable? That, that this, this uh, yeah, if you're only allowed separable, separable measurements, then this is the, the best that you can do or like the least number of samples that you have to use to, to verify stabilization states or to verify bipart maximally entangled, just, just bipart, just bell state mm -hmm. with confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I will give a proof sketch is that uh, from this result, it's actually possible to show that for any entangle stabilizer states, uh, this bow also holds so that you cannot, you can do no, do no better than this bow for the bell state. And the sketch of the arguments, so I, I don't like the explanation here, it's from my old version of slides, so I guess just, <laughs> and just look at this picture. So if I have any graph state, so now I just think of graph state as a representative of stabilizer states, uh, as long as it is, if it's non-empty, so there's some edge, and I can always uh, do what by partition it, uh, and there there will, obey, will always be if the graph is non-empty, there's always be some qubits such that this by by partition uh, is not 
that the entanglement across the bipartition is maximum. And this is uh, because of the fact about graph state that, uh, so basically, I guess, intuitively it's followed from Schmidt decomposition, right? That yeah, if once one part subsist, one part of it is just two dimensional, then I can only have Schmidt rank like uh, yeah, one or two. It's either a product state, so it's a lone vertex, or it's, it's maximally entangled. But uh, sorry, what do you mean maximally entangled in a sense that it has maximal von Neumann entropy, or is the reduced density matrix maximally mixed, or the yes. only. It is both. Yeah, across. Oh. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it just suffices to, to ensure that some. Uh, Local reduced density matrix is max uh, is uh, like maximally mixed state. Right. Okay. And then yeah, the the main idea would be that uh, you can reduce this bipartite case to sort of argue that if this has a spectral gap that is larger or better than two thirds for the Bell state, then you can show that uh, you can also do better have better spectral gap for Bell state, which contradicts the result that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's sort of a simple idea for the proof. Uh, right, so that's the bow. And then this is a part uh, that, okay, we don't have a lot of time. So, so I guess to summarize a little the bit. the time, there were many questions, you know, yeah. And in this part, well, actually, so yeah, so now we have an up, uh, well, depending on which quantity I, I think of, we have a bound on the efficiency of the local verification of any stabilizer states. And so the real question is that is this an optimal bound? Can you always saturate this bound? And I guess I would describe it in. Uh, worse how this goes. So our result is that for, uh, so we have an algorithm that explicitly construct this optimal uh, measurement protocol that give this, uh, yeah, give this verification, verification scheme with uh, the optimal spectral gap. And, and then we use it to find uh, optimal measurement scheme for of stabilizer states up to seven qubit, and the number seven is is just some convenient choice. It's not it's not fundamental or anything. But as as because the numerics just run until seven or what? Uh, so actually we we explicitly okay. I will point out to this uh, canonical reference. So in the paper by uh, Hi Eisler and Brickell, they uh, yeah, they give the local unitary equivalent class of all stabilizer states up to seven qubits. Mm -hmm. And so you have a description here and actually, oh, and there are 45 class of them. And actually there's a, another paper that give like a, oh, a 101 classes for uh, eight qubits. So just, just for, so like, just eight qubits and no lower. And actually what we have done in this paper is that we also have a table, something like this thing on the right of an explicit protocol for the measurement scheme. And this already take like 12 pages for seven qubits. Mm -hmm. so, so in principle you can do, so this, uh, if I remember correctly, for each uh, state, for eight qubit, you can still run this algorithm in like one second to give the uh, optimal protocol. So yeah, it's not a fundamental barrier, but there are still some uh, some exponential scaling hiding inside the algorithm, which I might try to explain uh, a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, so all all in all, the effect is that. Um, it is possible to, to, well, I don't want to use the word verify, but 
it's possible to check that this bow uh, is actually saturable by some kind of linear programming. So it's technically it's not even, so it's like it's not completely numeric because you run new linear programming and you get the answer exactly that is like, yeah. Um, right. And then, yeah, this is just a problem for my preparation. So I used to have this slide uh, to just, just one slide to explain this algorithm, but then, uh, yeah, since the time from previous talk, the algorithm has improved and I realized that the new algorithm is, it will be hard to explain how it works because it involves a lot of like symplectic formalism. And so I sort of just gave up, uh, like try to fully explain it, but. Uh, you can explain the previous one to give us a gist. Uh, Let's or... see. So I think the only difference is that, so in the previous one, well, this one doesn't. Just what is the idea for this algorithm? Just generally what you do. Yeah. So, so you start by uh, yeah, having the description of your graph set, like adjacency metrics. And then now the brute force part comes is that you look at all the poly measurement. So all like three to the n poly measurement. Mm -hmm. And then uh, find the, uh, after some filter to save time in, 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 in this algorithm that I wrote here, you, you find all those local subgroups. So yes, actually the philosophy is just to find all possible way to partition the measurement of your stabilizer group into things that are uh, locally measurable at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then the detail is just in the in how you go about it, uh, but you can imagine that because you have stabilizer sets, you have you can play around with its efficient description and construct some new theoretical tools or yeah that that let you sort of like compress the information. In this case, it's this matrix A mu, and mu here is uh, is a symplectic vector that, that precisely describes your poly measurements. So you have like three to the n of these vectors, uh, and then you put it in the machine, like uh, turn the crank, and then you get all the uh, test projectors. Uh, there's some nice thing here where you can reduce the number of test projector a lot because a lot of them will be redundant. A lot of them will be uh, will contain a smaller test projector, and then you can. Mm -hmm. try to get rid of all of these and then in the end do uh, solve a linear program to minimize the second largest eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there are other results that uh, you can ask so, me about something that previously. So is it basically the way I understand it is that uh, you're supposed like you know you're given a uh, a zero dimension coding space so that could be an n n okay n independent stable so you want to see all different possible n stabilizer generators right and then for that you want to minimize the weight of each i mean you want to try to minimize the weight of all of these stabilizer generators is that correct the poly weight the weight uh weight where you don't perform Identity, like so. Suppose, like you have, a, suppose you have n qubits, but the Pauli measurement is x, x, and then identity on the rest of them. Yeah. The so. So I guess the answer is no, because if I don't measure some qubits, I basically waste the measurement setting. So actually, it can be shown that it's uh. Is sufficient. It's like uh. Yeah, it's okay to just measure step uh, Pauli measurement with the full weight. So I think you are thinking, you're having something kind of different way of thinking. Are you guys talking about the same thing, by the way? <laughs> I don't I'm know. I'm not totally sure. 
okay, never mind. Then I'll probably message you. I mean, what, what Nina says was simply that. Hello. Oh, Sometimes we don't hear you now. I think he freezes. Oh man, he was about to say something so important. <laughs> now we don't. It's anger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but I I guess uh, right. It's like I I think uh, Talmai Nia has something different in mind, like to, like. There is no cost, it seems, in measuring, in his sense, like operators that have very good, uh, very large weight. Because it's not actually about, okay, because it's about POVMs as opposed to instruments. Okay, so it's not difficult to measure. I, I understand that in, in, in the context which you are more familiar with, like this measurement of ZZZZZ is very complicated because it creates entangled states, it's a resource for computation sometimes, whatever. But here it's only about uh, POVM, so you don't see what, like, you, yeah. Like, yes, I guess that, uh, the way to describe it and not, like, contradict the way that Tan may think about it is, is when I say something like measure Z, 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 I'm, I'm not meaning correlated measurement, it's just like a shorthand for each party measure Z. And so if in your setting, some party doesn't measure anything, they don't do anything, then it's just, uh, yeah, you get no information in that setting from, from those parties. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> yes, Sultan, we are um, in waiting for yes. you. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm hiding myself here. Um, but are you going to say something, Zoltan, or not? No, no, I, I, I was like waiting now for the, we can actually stop the recording maybe. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, uh, no, so I tell you, I can tell you what happened yesterday during the defense. Like, okay, uh -huh. maybe I, I postponed for the after the. So, like, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. So, so. so far, guys. What was like here the, uh, like, like, okay, this is, this is of course for a verification where you already know, right, that you have a stabilizer state. Uh, well, you, you know that you want the stabilizer state. You want to verify whether your unknown state is close to the, verif to the stabilizer state or not. So the state that you receive can be anything, including mixed state. Ah, nice. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. I see. But you also get which stabilizer state you have from this procedure. You choose. Right. Yes, I guess that was the answer. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can I just ask, because uh, it wasn't clear for me, uh, this optimality, is it unconditionally proven that if you do local measurements, local Pauli measurements, every stabilizer state you can verify in constant number of queries with like uh, good uh, like success probability or, uh, or it's something that you conjecture is the case. And then you have like a proof of it somehow, uh, sort of verification of this until like seven or eight. Uh, uh, yes, it's the latter. Yeah, it's a conjecture. So I can I can say something about that. Is that uh, yeah? So we have this bound, and then it is con we conjecture it that it is saturated. Satur yeah, it can be saturated for all uh, stabilizer states, even maybe just using these non-adaptive Pauli measurement. Uh, and my comment on this is that it seems difficult at the moment to, or very difficult to find a uniform, yeah, trying to find like a uniform, like analytic proof, if you would, that, that this bow is saturated, uh, like without giving an explicit mm -hmm. example. But on the other hand, it is entirely possible that if you just focus on some particular family of stabilizer states, 
uh, with respect to the number of qubits that you would be able to, is it possible that you would be able to prove something like that, that the, that the bow is saturable? For example, G, for GSC, you can, yeah, there's actually turned out to be one, only one unique optimal strategy and you can prove it. Mm -hmm. And for, yeah, and you can, for like near GHC state, where what I mean is that mm -hmm. uh, in terms of graph state, the GHC state is represented by a star graph that just has one center node and then it has a bunch of nodes that come out. Uh, you can try like add nodes on, on the non central nodes, and this is what I call the GHC like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can still, uh, you have more than one optimal strategy, but you can sort of still prove by hand that, mm -hmm. uh, like what okay. what the optimal strategy look like. So that that is about the bound. But so is it known that like because like maybe I mean this bound maybe is even valid. That I mean maybe this conjecture is true, but maybe there is some weaker bound that is still like like a bigger quantity, but the one that like, I mean, we carry like upper bound that would be that would still give like a constant, you know. Uh, ah, like uh, you know, constant. I mean, dependent of the system size. The the number of constant samples. independent. Uh, I think for let me. So in term of, uh, yeah, let me know if this answer your question. In term of like coming up with simple strategy, uh, there is something uh, from papers by Huang Jun and uh, Hayashi that, uh, for example, you can measure, you can have your graph and then you can have the coloring of your graph. And then for each coloring, so like maybe I have like some red here, then say I measure X on all of these, and then on, on this uh, nodes with this color and then measure Z on yes. all other nodes. And then that count as one setting, right? And then you do this for every setting. So you have as many settings as the number of colors. And then there you can show that, uh, yeah, this spectral gap is bounded by one over the chromatic number of the graph. So there's something like that. I see, so if you, uh... Right, chromatic number is the maximal number of colors. That's Color, yeah. Okay, so for example, if you know like the upper bound on the, uh, like that you don't have uh, too many, if you like, you when you have like upper bound on the connectivity, then you, you are, you, you can do it sort of efficiently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah something like that. Yes, thanks, thanks. So, okay, it's like, it's uh, taking quite some time this discussion. So please, uh, you want to, co uh, conclude or uh... uh yeah i guess uh this i guess this slide is probably like a advertisement for the paper at this point <laughs> but there there are other results in in the paper is it's become pretty big including the table of like 38 pages or something mm -hmm. uh so it's, it has a lot of details maybe a bit comprehensive but yeah there is some samples of other results that I don't have time to explain. For example, uh, we can prove something that uh, necessary condition this is not a lot, but uh, necessary condition for optimal verification of stabilizer state by public measurement. For example, that they, uh, you have to make for each qubit. Uh, I don't have an index for qubit here, but uh, I should write like PXJ, PYJ, PZJ, mm -hmm. that for each qubit, uh, the probability of measure X, Y, Z on, on that qubit should be equal, for example. Mm -hmm. So one of like a great or far, but far away goal would be trying to prove necessary and sufficient condition <clears throat> for optimal mm -hmm. measurements. Uh, we also study this optimal XZ strategy because it's, I guess, simpler to analyze and Huang Jun has done a lot on the, from his hypergraph states about this. Uh, yeah, and then this get into some, some graph coloring thing. Uh, here, right. 
So I mentioned a little bit in the algorithm that when we have, when we go, when we have gather or like create all these canonical test projector, there'll be a lot of redundancy. And the smallest test projector that is, uh, yeah, that test projector that is the best one is the one that does not contain a smaller test projector because we uh, try to minimize the eigenvalue. So it sort of create a, it create a partial order in the set of test operator. And we, we call this like best test operator that doesn't have any smaller, doesn't contain any smaller one. We call it as admissible test predictors and then we prove something about them and related to some other protocols, whether uh, like some, like those coloring protocols that I mentioned, whether uh, like to characterize whether each setting is admissible or not. Again, based on some graph property, like here, if the coloring is form a maximum or independent set. Uh, and also we spend a lot of time in the paper with uh, minimal number of settings, the problem of minimal number of settings for verification that pretty much parallel this uh, part about optimal verification, meaning that we have, uh, we prove some relations between different number here, which I haven't told you what they are, but, uh, and then we, 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 we verify the relation of uh, these numbers for up to seven qubits and we make a conjecture that's really parallel to the optimal one. So here, uh, if I may say something about is this, how we call this uh, thing in our paper, this chi, well, the most familiar one is actually the chi, this is a chromatic number of the graph. Uh, however, uh, for a given stabilizer state, uh, the associated graph is not unique because you can transform between them by local by by Clifford. Uh, yeah, some local Clifford transformation does it have to be local? Sure, but yeah. All uh, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so. So in general, you have, there are multiple graphs that can have different values of chromatic number that's associated to a single graph state. And so the chi LC here is the minimum, the, like the minimized uh, graph. So it's a graph associated with the graph state, uh, but with uh, the smallest number of uh, chromatic number. And then this chi tilde two here is the minimum of minimum number of settings to verify, given that each party can only do two kind of poly measurements, X and Z, for example, but it can be different for different parties. And then ultimately this one is chi tilde is just the minimal number, like period to to use to ver number of settings to verify the state. And then it's kind of like by definition, you have this kind of relation, but you have a graph state up to seven qubit, they're actually, uh, okay. So the first three are the same because you can transform the, first three turn out to be equal because uh, for the last one for the chromatic number, you can transform it to graph with more connectivity if you like. And then we put out some conjecture about uh, yeah, whether this equality holds for a general graph state, right? Do we have more slides? No. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I, I have a final Thank question you. here, or for, from my side, final. So you had this algorithm, uh, if you go mm -hmm. back a little bit. Okay. And like, uh, is the algorithm itself uh, like the like uh, efficiently like finding this optimal verification protocol? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And is yeah, the answer is no. There is one mm -hmm. part that is exponential here, which is to uh, to go through all the poly measurements. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. 
because because yeah. I was just one exactly. So that that one is an it, so the although the 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 verification protocol uh, is optimal, finding it is is hard. Okay. I mean, you could have this feeling also from this coloring, right? Because also like the coloring, the color graph is an MP hard problem. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay. right. So I, I guess you, yeah, the, the parallel fact is that, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, some algorithm that has to do, has to learn this like chromatic number is, is probably also hard. Yeah, yeah, that's also MP, yeah. Yeah. Complete. Yes. So there were some recent results about uh, I don't know, transfer like transfer uh, like NP hardness of transformations between graph states, right? By uh, yes. this uh, Canadian right. guy, Zoltan. Right. You know, like yes, 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 yes. Of course. Fermion slash Canadian. <laughs> exactly that guy. I know who you mean. Who is, by the way, now in in face in Terhal. Where? She he was in with Terhal. Now he is he's in a in the in the in the startup company of Montanaro and Qubit, Facecraft or something like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. So now, okay. Let's thank uh, Ninat for uh, for the very nice talk. Thank yes. Thank you for listening. We have time, some time for questions or comments. Uh, hi, Tom. Yep. Yeah. Question is. Um, look, okay, so let's say that you're in, um, I think it, I think it's difficult for me to consolidate the question. Look, um, you have hypergraph states, you have graph states, you have, you know, I can create some other subset of stabilizer states, right? Uh, I haven't seen, right. I mean, like, do you know if there is any, suppose I keep thinking it's smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? and then I say that I want to, the problem, I want to have an efficient verification protocol you know, for the subset of stabilizer states, make it smaller, smaller, smaller. Do you know if mm -hmm. there is uh, some sort of a trade-off between, let's say, uh, um, the optimal, I mean, the spectral gap, the maximum, the, the, spe the maximum spectral gap, and let's say, you know, the, Okay, never mind. I'll 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 I'll, I'll, I'll ask you later. I guess. When I, when I... I think I sort of get what you are trying to ask. It it will depends on the class of states. I think so. Like for uh, yeah, because of our th this result for stabilizer state uh i think we probably just believe that the bow is constant is the same for all stabilizer states yeah but for a hypergraph state it would be more compli complicated and that's maybe more aligned with what you're thinking of yeah okay, i'm thinking of like you know whether if you make something small if you the, the set of states that you're interested in for which this scheme will work uh, if you make that smaller and smaller and smaller, you could potentially get better optimal uh, this thing spec I mean, like you could probably get better uh, this spectral gap, right? I mean, higher spectral gap, and that'll perform perform better. That's what I was thinking. That's the line along which I was thinking. But uh, I guess it will also depend upon how you narrow out into smaller things. You could do something very symmetric, or you could do something to do something that's complete chaos. So. Well, I guess even here for us general stabilizer states, the, the, strat the measurement strategies are not uniform as far as I know, because I don't notice any pattern. So it's like, yeah, for each class of, for each stabilizer state, I would have to yeah, figure out the optimal strategy for, for it. And then it doesn't really, I guess, transfer to other stabilizer states that are not quite similar. Does it make sense? Yeah, but then in this case, the bow are still the same. 
I think you're approaching yes. the answer to the question in like in a different way. So then, like, yeah. the question is, you know, can you like what it, you know, you want something that is efficient, and then you also want to be able to apply this to a good number of stabilized states. So, is there a trade-off there? Something like that. Ah, ah, ah. I see. Okay, something that definitely we can think about uh, later, uh, or you guys can, I mean, sorry for the, like, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe some other questions. So, okay, I, uh, mm, pom -pom. okay, I, I was just wondering, so what, what uh, okay, is there a chance that, I don't know, some randomized construction would work, you know, like, you can say, okay, you don't know how to construct, like sometimes you don't know how to construct the, like the optimal things, right? Uh, but you can uh, say that, uh, you know, by, ra you can say that yes. okay, random choice of those uh, measurements that you perform, you will be doing pretty well anyway, so. Uh, yeah, it's very possible uh, that there be some, there might be something like that. And then there would be no need uh, to to use uh, you know uh, algorithm, right? In principle. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just I, I just have one like two general questions. So uh, so that was about states. But what about uh, there are other important objects like uh, unitaries and measurements, right? So are there like what 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 are the like approaches there let's say even I, in the stabilizer world mm -hmm. i'm aware that there are about like two or three papers about this and they're all well one paper is also from hong junju and they're all it's like chinese favor from china uh yes yeah, so there's like a group of people there that uh, diligently working on this uh, mm -hmm. and for but I never read it in detail I think it uh, I think that in the end they essentially sort of well I guess there are a few ways one is to do the Choi-Yamilkowski transformation and sort of think of verification of operation as verification of states in that way uh, and then I'm not sure if uh, there's also a paper that sort of, let's see, because what you can try to do is to put some in specific input state into the channel and then try to verify what comes out of it. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, like I guess, level, but can you still then get, uh, like fidel like uh fidel. I, I guess you can do yeah. some, uh, fidelity when you do chari right yeah i think so but yeah i think it's like one of the difficulty of 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 going to the channel because 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 uh yeah using fidelity for the states makes the analysis kind of pretty straightforward like the thing that come out doesn't look complicated yeah yeah, yeah so i think uh, in that direction is pretty much in, is in fancy. I know that those two papers like give some some examples of unitary channels or something like that. So it's it's probably not very systematic yet. So so it's not known like can you verify efficiently any stabilizer unitary, for example. Uh, actually, to not be make a mistake on it, it should. No, okay. It's, if you don't know, you just we can think about it. That's, uh huh. All right. Yeah, but then then the, the yeah, the like the for example so the title of two paper is just like efficient verification of quantum channel. It doesn't <laughs> yeah, specify any class of anything. They just like introduce idea and some examples. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I would assume that it's an open question. Okay, okay. Uh, cool. To some degree. Yeah. All right. I guess we uh, exceeded the the limit. Thanks a lot again, Ninat. Thanks Thank so much for showing up.